So we'll be talking a little bit about blood pressure this evening. I uh, wrote this out today. I went over some things that we hand out at the office and I updated this. And uh, the first thing that I put on there is actually wrong, but that's okay. It says ideal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. I went on to a uh, uh, program that I have in the computer and in the office. It's called Up to Date, and it's a um, site that you have to you you pay to go on to it. And uh, I thought, well, I'll see what Up to Date has to say. Up to Date, as the name indicated, is updated regularly. And according to that uh, site, uh, which the uh, people that publish that are based in Boston. Uh, the risk of stroke and heart attack and cardiovascular disease starts climbing once the blood pressure exceeds 110 over 75. So we talk about the definition of high blood pressure and there's prehypertension and there's hypertension and you know, it's really similar to blood sugar. Uh, your blood sugar risk, fasting, your, your risk from high blood sugar starts going up once you pass 90. Your fasting sugar, once it passes 90, your risk starts to go up. And it goes up every point. And you don't get to be a diabetic until you're diagnosed with a fasting sugar of 126. But if you're 125, you're not a diabetic, you're still at risk. The same is true with blood pressure. If your blood pressure is 110, that's good. If it's 112, that's still a really good blood pressure, but the risk is slightly higher. If you're 120, that's really good, but the risk is slightly higher. And uh, the next statement there has held true uh, for many years, and that is for every two points that the systolic blood pressure exceeds 120, and really according to up to date it's 110, exceeds 120, the risk of stroke is increased by 50, 15% and the risk of heart attack by 10%. So if you want to do the numbers, by the time you're to 140 over 90, that's where high blood pressure starts. Prehypertension is 120 to 140, but high blood pressure starts at 140 over 90. That's 20 points up. Divide by 2, you get 10. 10 times 15, that's already 150% increased risk of stroke and 100% increased or double the risk of heart attack. So that's why we say an ideal blood pressure is less than 110 over 75 because risk does go up. Okay, great question. What about age? Uh, blood pressure used to be called essential hypertension. Have you heard that term? Yeah. Essential hypertension? The theory was that as you age and your arteries harden, it is essential for you to have a higher blood pressure so that you can pump blood around. That's not true. In fact, a normal blood pressure when you're 85 is still the same as it was when you were 15. In, in countries where they don't eat refined food and it's mostly a plant-based diet, if you check the blood pressure of the average 85-year-old, you will find that actually their blood pressure is lower than a 60-year-old because there's a peak and it peaks around 65 normally and then the blood pressure tends to tail off in countries where the people or in areas where the people are very active and on a plant-based diet. Uh, that's what's normal. It is not normal to have your blood pressure go up. Uh, what you want is your blood pressure to stay 110 over 75 or less throughout life. That's ideal. Now, having said that, if you do have severe arterial disease, 
Earth, which isn't normal, but if you have that, you may not be able to tolerate a blood pressure that low. And so we need, may need to make some adjustments. And I have patients that have severe hardening of their arteries that I can't take their blood pressure that low with medication. But if I can get them to change their life and follow some you know, guidelines and their blood pressure comes down that low, they don't have any side effects and they do much better. If you look at curves of risk in high blood pressure, as up to date published, I reviewed them today, what you find is the higher your blood pressure goes, the higher your risk of stroke and heart attack go. And the lower they go, the lower the risk goes, unless you bring it down with medication. If you bring it down naturally, that continues to fall all the way down to 110 and over 75. If you use medication, instead of falling like this, what happens is it falls, but then there's a division where the risk starts, instead of dropping, it starts to flatten out as you come down. And at around, in the 120s, it flattens out, and if you keep pushing blood pressure medicine, actually it'll start to go up. Why? Because there's side effects to medication. But if you do it naturally, the risk continues to drop all the way down to 110 over 75. So if I have a patient on medication, I'll often say to them, if your blood pressure is in the 120s, not all medicine, certain medicines that you can stop and start without problems. If your blood pressure is in the 120s or less, you don't have to take your medication. But if you find that it's higher, do because there's that flattening and then I don't want them to take medication and then have a higher risk. Now we used to think that that was you know around 140. Now we know that dropping the blood pressure all the way down to 130s, 120s maybe with blood pressure medicine is beneficial but you get continued benefit if you drop it naturally below there. Questions on that? That's a really important point. Yes, you had a question. When I have 110 over 67, sometimes I'm losing consciousness. Okay, sometimes the question is, and, and I'd, I'd encourage you when you ask questions, don't get too personal, uh, you know, because pretty soon I'm doing an exam on you, and we don't want to do that. But, um, generally speaking, as the blood pressure comes down, if you're using medication, you can get symptomatic. If, if your blood pressure's been high, 170, 180, and you lower it to 120s, you will feel lightheaded and dizzy. You will. So you may have to back off of the medicine, and so you can get a little bit more normal feeling until you can get it down naturally without medication. There are people that have problems with their um, nerves so that when you stand up, your blood pressure drops. That's a whole different problem. It's orthostatic hypertension. Sometimes you have to wear support hose and different things so you won't pass out when you stand up. I, I can go into that l more later, but I'd like to get through some of this stuff first, but that's an interesting point. I'll take your question in a moment. Let's move ahead. Having elevated blood pressure, we talked about the risk of stroke and heart attack, the 15 and the 10 percent for every two points. Here's another important point. Having an elevated blood pressure in midlife, that's 40 to 60, conveys a greater risk for dementia than having the genetic tendency toward it. That is the APOE epsilon, I didn't have an epsilon sign on my computer, but it's APOE4, APOE epsilon 4 allele. That's the genetic uh, inherited tendency toward Alzheimer's, and if you have that, you have a markedly increased risk for Alzheimer's. But if you have high blood pressure in midlife, that will give you more risk than if you have the genetic tendency. 
don't forget high blood pressure is not good for your mind or your brain. Either one. You don't think clearly when your blood pressure is high. That's your mind. And in high blood pressure over years causes shrinkage of the brain. <coughs> Loss of brain cells through microinfarcts. That's many strokes from high blood pressure. Don't underestimate this problem. Worldwide, hypertension is the number one cause, underlying cause, of premature death. If we could get rid of high blood pressure, we'd make a tremendous impact on the health, the health of the people in our world. So it's a really important uh, thing for us to talk about. So next I'm just going to go over 10 things that you can do to lower your blood pressure without medication. Now if you're on medication, you still want to do these things or at least talk to your doctor about doing them. If you have kidney problems, you're going to have to be careful with number one because some people with severe kidney disease, if they increase their potassium intake, get into trouble. And don't try that. Don't increase your potassium if you have severe kidney disease. In severe kidney disease, you can't get rid of potassium and it can build up and if potassium builds up high enough, you'll have a heart irregularity and die and you don't want to do that with low blood pressure. Of course, everyone's blood pressure goes low after they die and that's a cure for it. <laughs> but it's not recommended. <clears throat> so one of the major causes of high blood pressure is too much sodium and too little potassium. And, and these are linked. You can't de-link them. You, you'll look at many studies and most of them will say the lower the sodium intake, the lower the blood pressure. But if you don't increase the potassium while you're lowering the sodium, you won't get near the benefit from sodium lowering. If you look at the recommended daily intakes of these minerals, it's very interesting and I have them there. The recommended daily intake of sodium maximum is 2,300 to 2,400 milligrams a day and the average American is getting about 3,400 to 3,600 milligrams or, or a thousand more than they should. Uh, well, how, how much is that? 23 to 2400 milligrams of sodium is how much sodium is in one teaspoon of salt. So you get about a teaspoon of salt a day. That's what's allowed. Um, but remember, 90% of the salt you eat is not added at the table. It's already in the food before you get it to the table. Uh, there's sodium in food that nobody adds salt to. There's sodium in put tomatoes before you put salt on them. So you have to keep that in mind when I say one teaspoon of salt, that's total. Uh, do you know what the number one source of salt in the American diet is? Number one, two, three? Well, bread and cheese are right at the top of the list and the other one is chicken. Why chicken? Because they add salt to the carcass of the chicken so it'll pick up water and it weighs more and when they sell it they can make more money on it. Fun, isn't it? Yeah. So you didn't know but that chicken was high salt. But bread and cheese are very high in salt too, usually. Look at the sodium contents on things. It adds up very quickly. Okay, the sodium intake maximum is 2300 that's recommended. The minimum potassium intake for a person without kidney problems is 4700 so milligrams. So they recommend about double the amount of potassium as sodium. And if you look at what we do, we get too much sodium and not enough potassium. So we need to reverse that. And if you do, often the blood pressure will just drop. It just takes care of itself. Too many times people just cut their salt way down and they don't increase their potassium. 
I don't recommend potassium supplements. I recommend foods that are high in potassium and I've listed some of them. You can go on to the internet and you can look up high potassium foods and uh, those are good for you. Uh, uh, basically what you want to do is look at your plate and say, do I have my high potassium food on here? Okay, I have a serving of it. Do I have two servings of it? Because you need, if the average food, high potassium food, has about five, four to five hundred milligrams of potassium per serving. Whether that's beans or greens or avocado or banana. Banana is actually a little less than beans and greens and avocado, but uh, it's about four to five hundred. So if it's four to five hundred and you need forty-seven hundred or about five thousand, you know, you, you need you need a lot of potassium food, right? So if you're getting two servings of high potassium food at a meal, that's going to end up 3,000. Okay? So at least that's a start. That's why I say look at your plate and say, okay, where's my high potassium food? There's potassium in almost everything. And so if you get two servings of a high potassium food at each meal, you're going to do fine. You're going to get the others and other things. Any questions about that? Yes, Kate. When I refer to beans, I'm talking about beans. Any beans. Some beans are higher than other, but all beans are high in potassium. Lentils and uh, lima beans are very high. Black beans, white beans, cannelli beans, great northern beans, Jacob's cattle beans. Can you think of some yellow eye beans? They're all high. Pinto beans. Pinto beans. Oh yes, Maggie, you've got to have those pinto beans. Soldier beans. Yeah, soldier beans. If you buy canned beans, usually they're high sodium. Right. If you buy canned beans, they're often high sodium. So what do you do? Well, you can rinse them. That'll help a lot. Or you can buy bean, canned beans without added salt. That is possible and I encourage you to look for that whenever you can. I don't mind putting some salt in beans, but think about how much you're putting in versus how much potassium, and remember you want about twice as much potassium as sodium in your diet for your blood pressure. Would this go for kids too, to follow this? It goes for kids. It's even more important for nursing mothers. They need even more potassium. Yeah. So get your kids eating right, and then when they grow up, hopefully they'll still eat right. Hopefully. All right, number two, if you're overweight, lose weight. Um, why? Well, for every pound of fat, there's a mile of blood vessels. So if you're 10 pounds overweight, and your heart pumps 60 times a minute, that's 10 miles times 60 beats. You do the math, and if you're 10 pounds overweight, your heart's pumping blood to the moon and back every day. But it doesn't have to if you lose those 10 pounds. So how much do you have to lose? Well, there are a lot of people that are overweight and their blood pressure is normal. Because there is a genetic component here, too. It's the first 10% of your overweight that you lose that does you the most good. So if you weigh 200 and you should weigh 150, it's that first... 20 pounds, so if you got to 180, I'm really happy, especially if you keep it there. If you're 300 and you need to be, well then weigh, drop the 30 pounds. I'm really happy you got there. It's the first 10% of your weight loss that does you the most good. The worst thing is to lose it and gain it. It's called the rhythm method of girth control. It doesn't really work well for blood pressure or the other thing. Yeah, okay. So if you're overweight, lose weight. If you lose a pound, that's helpful. Two pounds, that's great. Don't focus on your weight and say, oh, I got to get to my ideal body weight. No, no, no. Watch your blood pressure, do the other things, and lose some weight and keep it off. That's what will help you the most. Exercise more. Um, the studies have shown that um, 30 minutes is good, that's what's recommended, 30 minutes on most days of the week. Why didn't they say 60? Because they didn't think people would do 30. So they recommended 30. But 60 is better and 90 is better than that and probably 120 is even better. And what kind of exercise counts? Everything. 
Housework counts, gardening counts, walking around the grocery store counts. Just do it fast, especially in some aisles, right? Uh, <coughs> but, uh, but exercise helps. Uh, and the more, we were made to move. We're not made to sit still. Uh, it's, uh, that's just how it is. So exercise more. You don't have to do a set amount just more than you're doing now if your blood pressure's up. And when it gets to normal, you can say, great, I'm doing enough. Uh, so exercise more. Get more sunshine. You say, well, what about my skin? Well, what about your skin? You can have a few skin cancers and miss the stroke. How many would go for that? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't mind. And, and yes, sun burns cause skin cancer. No question about that. But it's really interesting. When you're out in the sunshine, you've gone to the beach, you come home, how do you feel? Relaxed. Why do you feel relaxed? Because your blood pressure's down because when you're out in the sunshine, the body produces more nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a really important compound. It dilates the blood vessels, it's an antioxidant, it reduces inflammation, it's wonderful. That's why when you go, have a day like today and you just say, I want to go out in the sunshine. Because you know in your head, in your body, that getting out in the sunshine relaxes you and it drops your blood pressure. It's just good for you. Don't get a burn. That's not, I don't want you to. Put on a hat. Do something. Uh, don't get a burn. But get out in the sunshine. It's very relaxing. It's good for you. It's good for your bones. It's, uh, it'll make you sweet to your spouse. Uh, lots of things. Get out in the sunshine and it's great for your blood pressure. And the best thing is do a little gardening when you're out there or you know, go for a swim or exercising in the sunshine is wonderful for blood pressure. Number five, I've already mentioned nitric oxide and what it does. Here's some foods that are rich in nitric oxide precursors. That's the building blocks of nitric oxide. Now there are other foods that are not on this list that are also rich in those that I put, didn't put down. And there's a reason I didn't. And they're mostly in the meat category and the crustaceans and that sort of thing. If you look them up, they're very high in arginine and citrulline and some of these things. I don't recommend them. Why? Because they're rich in fat and often in salt. And they will raise your blood pressure even though they're rich in arginine and citrulline. But you need some good sources of these. And I've mentioned some of the best ones. So good sources of arginine, precursor of nitric oxide, spinach. The nice thing about spinach and arugula is not only do they have nitric oxide, but they're rich in potassium, so you get, you know, two birds with one stone. So those greens are really what you want if you want to lower your blood pressure. Go for the greens and the beans for that matter, but uh, particularly the greens for blood pressure. They're really, really good to lower the blood pressure. Um, beets are very uh, rich in these, so rich that uh, in the last Olympics most of the athletes were drinking beet juice. They could have drunk arugula juice, but I don't think it would have tasted as good, but actually arugula will work better to lower blood pressure than beets, but it's only by a fraction. What these athletes found is even though they were highly trained, if they drank beet juice on a regular basis, their VO2 max went up by about 5%. That is, their ability to utilize oxygen increased by 5%. If you could get a 5% edge on everybody else in the Olympics, you're going to win, right? So in a highly trained athlete, they get a 5%, it's going to have more effect in someone like you or like me that's not quite so highly trained, although I'm trying. Uh, so those are good sources of arginine. Citrulline is another precursor of nitric oxide and good sources of that are watermelon, cucumbers, that cucumber soup. It had, it had of course, cucumbers in it and it had avocado, there's your potassium and it had, um, you had basil in the pesto, there's some potassium as well. So this was good for your blood pressure and that's one of the reasons that we chose it. Uh, other melons are also good sources of citrulline. 
Uh, yellow watermelon, interestingly, is, is very high in citrulline. It's just hard to find it around here in Maine. If you get yellow watermelon, people think it's spoiled. It's not. It's good. But you can't find it here very often. Uh, the arugula and watermelon are so good at uh, increasing nitric oxide levels that they've been used in uh, sexual dysfunction in a similar way to Viagra. So, uh, gentlemen, if there's a big arugula salad, just thank your wife, don't say anything, and prepare. Uh, <coughs> so, moving on to number six, there have been some fascinating studies done with flax seeds. Uh, they, they did a, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial where they put flax seeds uh, ground up in capsules and gave these people that versus a placebo. I don't know if they put sawdust or what in the placebo. But they found that on average, two tablespoons of flaxseed a day dropped the blood pressure 10 to 15 points on the systolic and seven on the diastolic. Now to get an idea of what that magnitude is, the average ACE inhibitor, that's Vasotec or Enalapril or Lisinopril or Captopril or any of those, some of you have heard of those, the average blood pressure medicine in that ca uh, class drops the blood pressure about five points. So they did a head-to-head -head trial of Enalapril against flaxseed and flaxseed won out. Uh, are there downsides to flax? Yes, there are. Some people can't tolerate it because they get gas. And if you cook it in your oatmeal, it's a little less noxious that way. Uh, but most people tolerate it really well. Uh, we grind it fresh in the morning and put it on our cereal, or my wife doesn't like it in her cereal, so she mixes it with applesauce and just has it, has it in her applesauce. What are some of the other goods? Uh, effects of flax. It's the richest source of lignans, which are phytoestrogens. As such, it will drop your risk of breast cancer lady, ladies and, uh, and uh, uterine cancer. Men, it drops the risk of prostate cancer and benign prostatic hypertrophy and all those urinary problems. And it is a great anti-inflammatory. Most people find that it if you have two tablespoons a day, it works about as good as one or two uh, ibuprofen a day for arthritis. So there's some really good effects from it if you can tolerate it. Uh, and it does lower the blood pressure in double-blind placebo-controlled trials better than one the top antihypertensives the prescribed. The are not as effective. No, they are effective if you don't get the placebo. But I would say... <laughs> You know, if you have to take two tablespoons of capsules, that's a lot. Just, just go down to the store. Walmart has this stuff. It's already ground. But if you buy it ground, once you open the bag, seal it up again and keep it in your refrigerator or freezer. If you buy the seed, you can just grind it fresh because it doesn't oxidize or give you trouble with oxidation. Yes. Yeah, the golden flaxseed, uh, I haven't seen head-to-head -head trials with the brown. It doesn't have quite as strong a flavor, but I think it's probably just as good. Uh, you can have golden, you can have brown. As long as you're eating it, I'm happy. Um, I think everyone should have it that can tolerate it. Question? Uh, two tablespoons are good. What about three? Uh, I have a patient that has uh, five <laughs> tablespoons a day, and he's tolerating it fine. But I will tell you, if you do that, you are going to have to get stock and toilet paper. <laughs> or you may have to call your plumber now and then because the, the size of the bowel movements will, are, can be amazing. I, I, <laughs> yeah, because flax really bulks things up. And uh, that's okay because your, your, your bowel was designed to be a sewer, not a septic tank. And uh, that'll keep you going. Four-year-old kids, what, what how much would you recommend? Uh, uh, some. Okay. Some. Yeah. A teaspoon, that's fine. Now, there's an interesting thing with flax. Those of you who are bakers, you can substitute flax for eggs because it's a binder. 
uh, two tablespoons of water, one tablespoon of flax works about the same as an egg in muffins or cornbread and it makes it better for you. So um, you can all make a run down to the store and get some you flax. Eat a lot of flax you need to drink a lot of water, right? Yes, if you eat a lot of flax you need to drink a lot of water. Anytime you up your fiber intake, if you don't up your water intake, you're going to make your bowels more firm. Now if you have a tendency toward diarrhea, that'll be welcome. If you don't, drink more water. I don't like to advertise stores, but Big Lots is cheaper than many for Walmart. Okay, good. Well, just make sure that you go to the store of your choice. Uh, and I hope they all have to import more flax to Maine. Uh, there we go. All right, uh, number seven, reduce or eliminate alcohol and caffeine. Uh, you can look at this any way you want, but I can tell you if you have more than two drinks a day, your blood pressure definitely goes up. And if you have more than two cups of coffee a day, your blood pressure definitely goes up. And don't drink a cup of coffee before you come to my office be, to have your blood pressure measured, because it'll be up. How, why is that? Because caffeine releases epinephrine into your bloodstream. That's how it works. That's why you get that little jolt when you take the stuff. Well, what does epinephrine do? Raises your blood pressure, raises your pulse. That's how it works. It's the fight or flight chemical. Uh, that's why we have so much fighting and flighting in our world because coffee's the, after oil, it's the number one commodity sold coffee. You wonder why we have the world we do. Question. Are you drinking something called instead of coffee? Uh, that's fine. It's, ca it's caffeine free. You can have caffix. You, green tea still has caffeine but the antioxidants in it are really good and it doesn't have as much caffeine and it doesn't raise the blood pressure nearly as much. Yeah, that black tea's fine, but green tea's better because it has better antioxidants. What I really want to see is a head-to-head -head trial of kale tea against green tea. I bet it would beat it out. <laughs> yeah. Question here. Any way you want to eat them. Uh, one thing you can do with beets that a lot of people don't realize is you can take a raw beet and grate it and put it on the salad and it's, it's great. It's great. Uh, but you can cook them. I don't care how you eat them. The greens are more easily digested if they're cooked. And I say cook some, eat some raw, do what you want. Just eat beets, eat greens, eat greens, and eat greens. If you eat enough, you'll notice that you're eating enough. Um, so that's caffeine and, and alcohol. Eight, reduce or eliminate animal protein intake. Uh, why? Because the protein, a high protein diet is, if you eat protein today that you don't need today, you excrete it today. Got that? You don't do that with carbs. If you eat carbs today that you don't need today, you store them. If you eat fat today that you don't need today, you store it. If you eat protein today you don't need today, you excrete it. How do you excrete it? As urea in the urine. That means the kidney has to process that and a high protein diet definitely puts a load on the kidneys. The kidneys control what? Blood pressure. So a high protein intake is harder on the kidneys and raises the blood pressure. Particularly animal protein, but you can do the same with vegetable protein if you refine it. If you go to soy protein isolate, Take all the fiber out, all the potassium out, all you, you can do the same with that. There are many reasons for this that have not to do with protein, like its effect on uh, mechanistic target of rapamycin, mTOR, and all that, but you don't want to go there yet. Afterwards, I'll talk to you about that. But limit or reduce or eliminate animal protein. Uh, drink six to eight glasses of water a day. So I'll have another drink. Why? Well. Every time you urinate, there's an obligatory loss of sodium. You lose sodium every time you urinate. And the more you drink, the more you, yeah, and the more exercise you get. So it's a win-win-win, right? 
Yeah, so uh, six to eight glasses of water a day. Don't overdo it because if you overdo it, you can get your serum sodium too low. There's a whole category of people, fortunately I don't see it very often, it's called psychogenic polydipsia. They think they're dirty inside, it's an obsessive compulsive disorder and so they're drinking, drinking, drinking. They're really easy to diagnose because their blood pressure is so low when they stand up they pass out. So don't go that far. And if you're a marathon runner, don't go that far because you can get into serious problems with too low a sodium. But six to eight glasses is about right. Uh, another way to gauge it is, you know, when you're washing things, you want to wash your dishes until the rinse water's clean, right? You don't want to wash it in dirty water. Well, just think about your rinse water and you want it kind of clear. Light yellow, that's good enough. But not, if, you're, if your rinse water, urine, is dark, you've either got a problem with blood in it or something else, or you're not drinking enough water. So just kind of monitor yourself. You want your urine to be light yellow and, or clear in color. All right, and one, and one more thing on that. They did a study with hibiscus tea and found that three cups of hibiscus tea a day worked about as good as uh, the average blood pressure medicine and that is it dropped the blood pressure about five points on the top, two on the bottom. That's what the average blood pressure medicine does. How did that work? They think because of the potent antioxidants. Hibiscus tea is really deep red and if you put two tea bags in instead of one that's even better. You get more of a boost from it. So you can have some good hibiscus tea as part of that water and it'll lower the blood pressure some. And then number 10, reduce the intake of refined sugar to lower your level of advanced glycated end products. We talked about these with diabetes. Anytime you have high blood sugar or high sugar in the tissues, you speed up glycation of proteins, that is stiffening. If you stiffen your artery, what happens to the blood pressure? It goes up. That's why when a diabetic comes in and the nurse takes their blood pressure and the blood pressure's up, I almost know their sugar's going to be up too. Or if their sugar's up, I, oh, their blood pressure's, they, they work together. So we want to keep that refined sugar intake low. Uh, the other way to do it is you can just have your cookies, you put that sugar in and just add flax to them instead of the egg up that fiber. You get the fiber up high enough even though there's sugar in it, it slows the absorption and you're golden. And so you can still have cookies occasionally, just keep the carb to fiber ratio at what? Five. Five, there you go, you, you go to the head of the class. And uh, you can make, uh, Lynn and I played with this last summer, we made some lovely ice cream using avocados which are rich in potassium and very rich in fiber as the base of the ice cream. Put some bananas in there and a few other things and we could add some maple syrup and have it really tasty and we still had a carb to fiber ratio of five or less. So you can still have some desserts, you just have to work with them a bit and you can get your blood pressure down. Any questions? You can take a supplement of arginine or citrulline. I do not recommend it because most of the foods that are rich in arginine and citrulline are good for your blood pressure in other ways too. Like the beans and the greens are high in potassium. And so I would rather you have real food than a supplement. Uh, much rather. Because we, there are so many benefits to these whole foods. They are really the medication you want. Years ago, Hippocrates said, he was the father of medicine, he said, let food be your medicine and let your medicine be food. And that's much better. The problem is this, you can't sell it as a doctor. I can't, and maybe I should open a farm stand next to my office, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, then I could have a food pharmacy, how about that? <laughs> F-A-R, yeah. Uh, but you can't put that stuff in a pill bottle and get the same benefit unfortunately. Eat real food, it's what will heal you, not pills. Question. How about turmeric? Turmeric is a really good antioxidant. 
it will lower inflammation, it would probably help the blood pressure. I don't know of any studies that have looked at it directly, but I don't mind if you have turmeric. It's also good for arthritis. It's good, the, the latest study I saw, it's really good for um, multiple myeloma. And it's it been effective against most cancers that it's been tried again against in vitro. That is, they grow cancer cells in a in glass in a petri dish. They sprinkle some turmeric on it or curcumin, and it slows the growth. Every one they've tried, that's been true. So I'm I'm all for you having turmeric, and I would rather you have turmeric than curcumin, uh, because there are other active parts of the whole. Uh, turmeric, turmeric, I should say, turmeric root that are active. Yeah, great question. Yes? Is hypertension, is there a genetic component to that? Yes, there's a genetic component, and the major genetic component is you tend to eat like your parents ate. There is still a genetic component, and I won't uh, tell you there's not, but the studies that were done by Kempner in the 40s showed that 80% of people with high blood pressure could reverse it with diet alone. So although there's a, um, a genetic component, it's not that large. It's sort of like cancer. There's definitely a genetic component to cancer. It's about 5% or less. Yeah. So I don't want to let people off the hook before they've gone all the way with, with uh, diet and lifestyle change. Although I'll tell you, I use medications to lower blood pressure because every day that goes by that your blood pressure's high is not good for your brain among other things. And I haven't talked about stress reduction. You know, I often uh, use this illustration I did today in my office. I said to my patient, look, if someone walked in the door and shot me and said, you're next, but I want to check your blood pressure before I kill you, what would their blood pressure be? It would be high. I hope it would, because I hope they were missing me. But uh, <coughs> stress raises your blood pressure. No question about that. It's a major part. And what's the best way to deal with stress? Exercise. Because exercise burns off the epinephrine from the stress. It's really, really helpful. And the more stress you're under, the more time you should take for exercise. But don't get stressed about it. <laughs> and do something you enjoy. You know, gardening or something out in the sunshine, walking, talking with a friend. Don't have exercise be stressful or you won't get the benefit from it. Question. Is it more beneficial to use potassium in a water softening system than salt? Is it better to use potassium in water softening than sodium? I don't know. I would guess so. Uh, because you will get some sodium in your water from that. Um, you know, water here in Maine, it's really good and really bad. And, and I, we've got friends that they, they put their water through like six different filters to get something that's drinkable. And uh, it can be really nasty. But there's some al also some really good water here in Maine. Uh, there's good springs right in this area and you can get water there and I'd encourage you to. What about distilled water? Distilled water's wonderful. If you want to do that, I think that's fine. Uh, it's fairly expensive to do it. Rainwater's probably pretty good, although it'll have some mercury in it if it fell from a rainstorm that came up the Ohio Mississippi Valley. You want to get it off a different r storm pattern, I guess. Question. What about uh, water from a well? When it's cold, it's okay. When it goes through an electric heater, it all of a sudden smells fishy. And they give you an anode rod to neutralize it. Works for a while and then it stops. Well, I wouldn't heat it then. <laughs> but I would get your water tested and see wh what's well, doing that. basically said you need an anode rod in 
order to sacrifice it and that smell will go away. Yeah, I'd still want to know what's causing it because distilled water has no odor and water shouldn't okay. uh, have an odor. Question. So if you eat a completely plant-based diet, do you have to take a B12? If the question was about B12, if you are on a completely plant-based diet, do you need B12 supplement? The answer is maybe. Well, that's no good. So either take one or get your B12 level measured. Uh, it, if you have normal reabsorption of B12, it takes about 30 years to become deficient if you have zero intake. But there are about 5 to 10 percent of the population that don't have normal reabsorption and B12 deficiency is serious. So either supplement, have a source in your diet, and most of the nut milks and soy milks are, have B12 added, or get your level checked. Uh, there's that answer. Okay, the question is about protein. Is there an amount per day that you need? Yes, uh, that's still in debate. There's a whole another lecture we could give on protein. Uh, basically, the first recommendation came from a German nutritionist back in the 1800s, and the way he arrived at it is he went into a German town and found out how much protein they were eating, and he found out the average man was eating 120 grams of protein a day and he basically said what the Germans do is good so it's good for the world and that's the science behind it. They actually looked into protein restriction during the depression and then on into the beginning of World War II because they wanted to know how low they could go in pro protein and K rations and they found no ill effect from a protein intake of 35 grams a day in adult men. 35 grams a day, you can't get that low and keep your weight on unless you're eating hard candy and all kinds of things trying to keep your calories up. So protein is a non-issue, total non-issue as long as you're eating a good variety of fruits and vegetables and nuts and grains and beans and other things. And if you're eating a not a plant-based diet, then your protein intake, the only question is you're getting too much. Uh, you know, probably a half a milligram per kilo is about right per day. Um, so for the average you know, if you're getting 50 grams of protein a day, you're doing fine. If you want more, if you're a bodybuilder, fine, but don't go too far. Question. Yeah, um, back to the blood pressure thing, I have low blood pressure. So if I do some of these things, I'm going to get the question is, she already has low blood pressure. How many of you want to get after her? And, you know, <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, no, it's not going to lower your blood pressure too low. Okay. No. It won't, as long as you're getting adequate fluid, or as long as you don't have a problem with the autonomic nervous system. I have a patient that I saw today in my office. It, I have her take excess amounts of salt. She probably has three teaspoons of salt a day. Why? She's got a problem with her adrenal glands, and if we don't do that, when she stands up, she gets real lightheaded and woozy, and on a good day, when her pressure's nice and high like it was today, it was 102 over 60. Okay, so, but that's rare. And if you have that, I want you to eat lots of salt. That's not the average person. That's fine. I'm glad when mine's 90 over 60. <laughs> yeah. Mine usually runs around that. It was high today. I thought, well, I better measure it since I'm lecturing on this. And it was 104 over 64, and that's high for me. And if I stand up quickly, I get a little lightheaded, and I think, good, I won't have a stroke. <laughs> <coughs> Question. Right, and that's from damage of the kidneys from the chemo, most likely. So you think that this will help you, regardless of the cause, it will help. 
but you may need some medicine in addition. Diet won't cure everything. It just won't. Uh, we don't live in a perfect world with perfect food and we got bad parents here and there and you know, but it, according to Kempner's studies way back in the 40s, 80% of high blood pressure is manageable with diet and exercise and lifestyle alone. And that's pretty good. Yeah. Question and then we'll let you go. Uh, you have my permission. No, she's severely allergic to avocados. something I can substitute to make the Oh, uh, talk to me afterwards. Oh, Lynn. This, this spring we went to visit our son and his wife. They're living in Sudan. And they wanted to make the soup because they have, they have lots of all of these things. Fresh dill. The only thing they don't have is avocados. So what, we, what I substituted was tahini. Yeah. You, you need a fat source in here so it'll solubilize everything and tahini works fine. Thank you for rescuing me, Lynn. Again. Okay, thank you very much.